Hello and welcome to the very first episode of Rap Chat from FNI, from myself, Paul Webster, and the very lovely, uh, the very lovely Paul Butler Lennox. Uh, yeah, this is um, this is our first. Uh, we're very very excited to have uh, the wonderful Nick Kelly, um, who has directed a lovely piece of work called uh, "The Drummer and the Keeper." Nick uh, may be familiar to some of you. He was in a band called The Fat Lady Sings. Uh, he's most well known for that. Um, and he's been a copywriter for years and a wonderful all around guy. And uh, yeah, we're delighted to have him. Um, and just before we get to the interview, um, just to give a little introduction to ourselves, uh, people probably know who Paul is uh, from his work with Film Network Ireland. Uh, I'm a filmmaker, a writer, um, and I guess one of the reasons I wanted to. Uh, get involved with the podcast was just to have conversations with people who are making stuff in Ireland. Uh, we listen to a lot of kind of podcasts that are k- kind of American and they're very they're great, but it's really good to hear homegrown talent and you know being able to hear people who have similar struggles to ourselves. Yeah, I guess just also to alleviate uh, you know the pressure of the filmmaking environment and get some advice and some nuts and bolts kind of information from people who are out there doing it at various different uh, levels of experience like uh, people who were um, you know starting out uh, people uh, and uh, from across the, the medium as well people who are involved in music uh, sound composition um, sound uh, composers and so on as well as directors and actors as actors actors as actors as actors as uh, and just anybody who has a, a hand in the Irish, you know, film industry, and we hope that you like it. And we're we're quite new to this, um, so thanks to everybody who's helping us. Uh, very grateful to the help from West uh, for the help from Westland Studios, um, who are who are helping us with a studio space here. Uh, and equally, I'd like to just take a minute just to uh, let people know, I guess, um, about our. Uh, our writing uh, two-day workshop with uh, Mary Kate and uh, Rachel O'Flanagan, which is coming up on the 14th and 15th of October. It's quite intensive, um, uh, and it should be, I, I think, of of great help to people who are uh, either about to start the process of of writing either their first short or if they're a bit further down the line in terms of a, a feature script. Um, it'll be a you know a really interesting um, excavational tool to uh, to get where you need to go. Um, so yeah, the tickets are available uh, via Brent, uh, Eventbrite. Now I can say that. Uh, and yeah, it's worth getting involved. We have uh, early bird uh, early bird tickets, um, which are available up until the thirtieth of. September, um, and then it goes up a little bit in terms of price, but it's still very affordable, so jump on it. I did a course with the Flanagan sisters a few years ago um, when I was writing my first script, uh, first feature script, and it really helped me uh, get things in order, and kind of, it it was very inspirational, it was really good, so I would recommend. So our first guest, uh, we're very happy to say, is Nick Kelly, is the director of The Drummer and the Keeper. this film is currently in cinemas. Uh, check out The Lighthouse and the IFI. We totally recommend it. Uh, absolute pleasure to talk to. Kelly, um, thanks so much for coming in. We really appreciate it. You're most welcome. Um, so a lot of people would know you as a singer, singer songwriter, and frontman of the Fat Lady Sings. Um, was m- music always your first love, or, d- or was film always there competing? No, I didn't know anything about film for years and years. I mean, I think all the way through the Fat Lady Sings, I was just I was so focused on being uh, my a pop star or a rock star. <laughs> Well, I'm failing to be one. And I, I kind of, my main experience of film in those days was just being in terrible videos. I was in so many terrible videos. Right. Um, and the only thing I learned or I brought from that experience was just was t- just to never do that to anybody else. Um, <laughs> and I was, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think, I, I, you know, 
and it's funny, I didn't even do art in school or anything. I didn't really particularly mess around with cameras or any of that stuff. I think I was always interested in storytelling. Okay. So I always wrote and I think that was a thing. And then I kind of, and one of the things people used to say about the songs and have always said about songs right through is that they were always written in a very, in quite a visual way. So which is interesting. And then I, after The Fat Lady Sings, I stumbled into writing ads. And I think I, all the ads I wrote were really visual in the sense of like lots of them didn't have any dialogue yeah. at all and I think that was so no I mean film was a thing I, it was only really when I was working on ads and then when you work on ads you're on the other side of the camera Yeah, you're not the idiot standing in the street miming you are uh, you're suddenly part of all of that you can see how it's put together much yeah. more and you go especially in advertising much more than you would in screenwriting you mean you choose the directors you go to all the castings, you go to all the shoots, and you spend weeks and weeks in post because you've got to bring it back to the client. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a, a brilliant crash course in, in filmmaking, actually. Is that, um, you're, are you kind of creative director as a writer then? In that I, well, you know what, I never know what title ever to give myself. So I've, it's just to be absolutely clear and yeah. for, for, you know, to, to not, you know, to be honest. I have never had the job of create. I've only had one job in advertising, and my job was copywriter or sometimes senior copywriter. Okay. But I, um, what a creative does in advertising, even what the difference between a copywriter and an art director is, or a creative director, I think it's really nebulous. I mean, okay. there's two bits to it. There's conceptual and executional. Now. So, you know, traditionally, the copywriter is the person who goes to all the sound recordings and you write the scripts. You actually do the writing. Okay. Traditionally, the art director goes to all the f the photo shoots and, you know, will brief the photographers and will end up doing all the layouts. But and, in terms and, of the, and, and eat all the Danishes as well. Uh, well, no, we all eat the Danishes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but actually, the person who has the idea could be anybody, it could be either of you, or it could be both of you, or it could be your crap idea, which they suddenly see an interesting bit of. And I think that's the other thing which is very interesting about advertising is that it's a brutally collaborative space in the sense that, you know, nobody cares who has the good idea. It just has to be the best idea in the room. Okay. And sometimes, God forbid, the client might have the best idea. And you do have to, I think you learn to honour the best idea. And I think that that's, if, if there was only one thing that I could tell my younger... Well, actually, funnily enough, I think I made all these mistakes in rock and roll, so that by the time I got to, to advertising, and certainly by the time I got to film, I'd sort of learnt them. But mm. the biggest thing I could offer somebody starting out is uh, it doesn't have to be your idea, it just has to be the best idea. And that, you know, you should... Anytime you work with somebody... Um, you should be open to whatever they bring because you, they're going to change. As soon as you're working in collaboration with other people, they're going to change your vision anyway. So you may as well empower them to change it for the better. So you'd consider yourself a, a collaborator in that respect? I Oh, I, I really do now. I don't think I was always uh, good at it, but I, I hope, I'm, I think I'm, I'm sure I couldn't be even better, but I really try. I mean, I, I, what I really think is that... Um, I think the biggest thing that you do is casting in, in both sides of the camera yeah. is the people you choose the people you work with. And once you've got that bit right and you're, and you're also pointing in the right direction, I think it's much more fun if you're collaborative, really. And, and you know, in the end, I mean, you, I mean, you're in the edit suite, you know, like you can decide it uh, fundamentally at the end. But, but, you know, why would you shut off those ideas? And you know, and uh, you know, and actors have brilliant ideas, and you know, your your DOP will have brilliant ideas, and your editor will have brilliant ideas, and a lot of the time they're better than your ideas, and you, you know, that's a gift which you have to you have to learn to accept. Yeah, and embrace. I mean, how, uh, for example, how would you cast? Do you have a very specific method of casting, or are you open to? Uh, finding new talent or are there specific do you write with people in mind specifically and uh, I'd, I'd said it's a mugs game to write with people in mind <laughs> uh completely because you'll never get them um i love casting I, I it's always really interesting anybody walks in so the first thing to say about casting and this is what you really also learn from advertising is quite often before somebody hits the mark almost 
before they line up and just introduce themselves, you kind of know if they're not right for this particular thing. Mm -hmm. And you should always, nevertheless, you, they should always they should always feel able to do their work, and you should always watch their work. Uh, because for, partially, first of all, you could be wrong. But the second thing is, and this has very often happened, is I've often cast somebody who was wrong for a thing that they'd come and, and read for me, but I remembered their energy and that thing they had. And later I said, that is, we should get that person in for this Transferable one. Transferable elsewhere. Well. Yeah. well, I think there's three things about casting. I think there's your, you know, are you six foot, you know, your physical attributes. Are you six foot three? Are you a woman? Are you, you know, 22 or 78? I mean, these are things that, you know, broadly speaking, are you know that's you have those things. You've got your skills and your experience. You know your chops. So you know those things are. You know, you see people who are really, really. There are differences in levels of 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 skill that you see, and and you know you can if you've got a really skillful actor, you can try things that sometimes you can, are harder to try with somebody who's less skillful. In, but actually, the really interesting thing, which nobody can really spoof, and nobody can really justify is energy and everybody's got their own sort of energy yeah and i think no more than if you're falling in love with another human when you respond to an actor a lot of the time it, it, you know all things being equal some somebody will come in and they'll suddenly knock you sideways just well, it's something magic that, essentially it's inexplicable it's a connection that you have and it's and I sort of I kind of trust myself in that because just I know I'm going to spend a lot of time with that person and and especially you know it's really interesting The Drummer and the Keeper is a film that is uh, made very quickly in its shooting like we shot in 20 days we've got a very big cast we didn't do lots of takes we you know it's very it's, it's quite a it's quite an ambitious movie in terms of like locations and yeah. action and so on mm -hmm. Um so we did get quite a bit of rehearsal and that was very important. But, you know, fundamentally, when you choose somebody, you know that you're going to have to trust them. And you know that like just that even the the feel that you have, if, you, if you're, you know, if you're kind of right about that, like that's that's really important because you're going to be out in some other space. And yeah. that's what you're going to be wanting to re rekindle or so recapture. It's essential, essentially, you have to go with your instinct. I kind of think you do. I, th I, I, I really think you do. But I, what I would also say is that, you know, different energies are right for different roles. And, you know, I, I've, I've often had the thing of casting people between projects, like where I'll see somebody who isn't right for one thing, but I'll cast them another thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've also had the thing of within a project, seeing somebody for one thing and not really buying them in that, yeah. but then really buying them in another role. And that's really interesting. And that requires... Um, like it's an awful, it's a beautiful thing to be an actor and it's a terrible thing to be an actor. It's so insecure making. <laughs> and I, I'm familiar with that process. And, and, I, and I just always say, you know, like, you know, whatever you go in, like, just do your work because you don't, especially if there's lots of people at a table. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that TV thing or that ad yeah. thing, like you can't, you don't know where the yeah. discussion lies. Mm -hmm. and, and people sometimes are very, you can get, like, you can't read more than two people or three people. So actually, it's much better for you just to go in and bring in your bring in your character and just do that and just be mm. quite Buddhist about it. And I think you'll, you know, the biggest thing is not to get in your own way. Mm -hmm. But I think if you do that, you know, you'll you'll what's it, that's that's what's meant for you. Won't go by you. Yeah, yeah. yeah that yeah, that thing. If I could just ask you about the uh, just the inception of the project. <clears throat> Uh, the drummer and the keeper about the catalyst project that you were involved mm. in with uh, the Irish Film Board. How did you find that process um, from start to the work on the piece during the project, and then in terms of executing that af afterwards? Sure. Was it was it an enjoyable experience? Was it difficult at times? How was it for you? I mean, the first thing to say is it's a totally fantastic thing to have happened to me, and <laughs> I would suggest strongly that anybody uh, you know who has the ambition to make a feature film, uh, you, I mean, you ha you know, in Ireland, I mean, you should definitely take it seriously because I had made a short film about five, um, in sort of 2000, well, 2010 and, and, and 
and we had done really well with that short film. Sure, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I had thought, okay, I'm totally going to get yeah. the money to make a feature film now. And I had been writing a feature script and I had a, I had a couple of feature ideas brought through to a certain level. And, and then I spent the next three years kind of going in and you know, pitching to funders like these ideas and, you know, and scripts and, you know, treatments and, and people generally thinking, oh, no, this is really good. It's really interesting, really nice. But nobody fundamentally saying, go off and make it. Yes. Yeah. And I found that Im immensely frustrating. And um, and then when the Catalyst thing was announced, I felt I could not go for it because it, it had been seven years since they'd done one. Yeah. And at so least just it, to explain what Catalyst so, is. So what moment. Catalyst is, is that it's an Irish Film Board initiative for first time feature filmmakers. Uh, and they put out a call in, I think it was 2014 in November or something like that, or, uh, or and they asked for, yeah, well, they had 400 places, I think about 700 people or something went, went for it, but they had 400 places on it. And that was the first time filmmakers by which they defined a writer, a director or a producer who had never made a feature film, helmed a feature film. Mm. And of those 400, I mean, 350 were writer directors and 50 <laughs> were producers. So there's two seminars in over two weekends in Croke Park and we all went there and there was various talks and Lenny got up and did a talk and Jim Sheridan got up and did a talk, you know, and, you know, Audrey from Element talked about marketing and, you know, it was kind of quite a helpful thing. But the real idea was that it was a sort of like a, a, a like, a, um, you know, speed dating that you're all <laughs> supposed to meet each other. And I didn't really know very many people. So in the 10 days between those two weekends, there were two, there was like a week fallow weekend. I just tried to take a you know sort of do research on every single producer there. I made a short list of about ten who I thought were pro were interesting and seemed to be experienced enough to be funded, and I tried to meet as many of those for coffee in the ten days in between. And I met I think seven of them for coffee, and I met Kate McCalgan who produced the Drummer and the Keeper and who did such a fantastic job. And I you know I met another producer. I did go in with two projects. I went I had a different producer um, and. So, and when I tell people that, I know it sounds uh, very, it sounds very type A and kind of, you know, swatty and <laughs> like, uh, and, but I just felt desperate because I felt that I, if I didn't get one of these pieces of funding, I could be spending another three or four years hacking around trying to, trying to persuade somebody to say yes. And it just seemed, you know, people, the odds, you're sort of thinking one in 400 is really tough odds. And then you're thinking, well, it's better odds than getting into Sundance or it's better odds than anything yeah. else. So, and actually, you know, so 89 projects went in in the end. And uh, there was quite a short, so I, I did it myself and there was like, I think the seminars ha happened and then the deadline was... About three March. months. Well, yeah, so about, um, well, there's Christmas. It, it, was, it was the end of November. So you had sort of December, January, February, March. And I deliberately hadn't written anything. I'd, I'd, for, for the drummer and the keeper, I had uh, an outline. And uh, I, but I deliberately not written anything because I also wanted to see and to not be, to again work out what is the the price of entry for this competition. Yeah. To understand, to listen in the room and see what are they looking for. And so I wrote that script and got somebody to read it like a, and then rewrote it in the three months. And I did the same with the other project, actually. So it was very, very intense yeah. three month around writing. So you went in essentially box and clever and trying to tick boxes, obviously to keep well, you know, the, uh, yeah. the integrity of the pieces of work you were working towards, but also, okay, what are they looking for and what can I do to alleviate my chances? Well, I, th I, think, I think it's hard to box clever, really. I think you can avoid boxing stupid. That's what <laughs> I was trying to do. I was trying to not make a, a, a fundamental mistake yeah, yeah. in, 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 kind of what I was pitching and, and, in, and you know, for example, there wasn't a requirement that you, they didn't say you have to send, put in a finished script, but I mean, it became absolutely clear that most people will be submitting finished scripts yeah. and you needed to be submitting that. Yeah. Um, we did a very, we put in like quite a serious presentation. I like had lots of references and mood boards and like, the, you know, I took a lot of trouble on it. Um, I think probably the biggest question that people would have asked. So we got down to the nine. We got shortlisted. Mm -hmm. So that was March was the submission. I think the shortlisting happened in September. I think there was interviews in October of 2015. I'm going to say, no, it was 2014. It's all a bit of a blur to me. 
No, I think it was 2014, actually, because because uh, we we went in, there's nine people shortlisted, and then we did presentation, and we were lucky enough to get one of the three projects. I mean, some of the other projects that got to the nine, I think, have been funded in different ways. Um, and the board always said that they were, they wouldn't, you know, if you got there, they would be looking anyway for other projects. And then I rewrote the script 24 times between that October and the f- and the February of 2015. Am I getting this right? Which is when we, we uh, no, 2016. 16, yeah. yeah. So there was a, basically 14 months of, of um, ca- rewriting, casting, pre-production. So it was, it, it was very quick to get the funding, the bit of work, mm. and then to get it right so it was actually shootable in 20 days and, and good uh, took quite a lot longer. Uh, so going from that, so if you just go back to the actual, actual writing of, mm. of the script, when you sat down, um, do you have did you have something you wanted to say with the film or did you just kind of let it, let it flow? I mean, I think you always, well, first of all, you don't know what you have to say. Yeah. That's the really important thing. You know, sorry, you know you have, you know there's something that strongly wants to be said by you, but what it is, is mysterious to you. I mean, that's generally my experience in all creative things. You know there's something bugging you, like a piece of sand in the shell of an oyster. Uh, Whether that is a piece of excrement or a pearl, we would find out later, but there is something that's very driving you. I think I was very, I, I was very struck by, there's two things I think for me that, that I was very struck by the idea of unlikely friendship and genuinely I've in my life generally I've found that uh, at moments of deep crisis the the correct friendships that you have so carefully curated are useless to you generally not through their own fault but they're just they're the wrong people because you've suddenly in crisis become a different person and the weirdest people come out of the woodwork and they're helpful and those are the so I've always I've I've noticed that in my own life and I've just seen in other people's lives that actually at times of crisis the kind of the the version of yourself including the 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 portfolio of friends that you have is is just it all's on the it's all the scrap heap really and emotionally you need something else and that something else often appears from the most unlikely source I mean like a, a kind of a weird um kind of hobgoblin angel like comes into your life and that's the person you need. So I had that idea and then I had this idea of two characters really based on two things that I kind of felt I knew. One was um, dysfunctional rock and roll people and having been in rock and roll, I knew a lot of them or I'd seen a lot of them and including people I think I didn't really realise that there might be a mental health issue going on with them. But, and you know, rock and roll was tolerant or even encouraging of kind of extreme behavior so you sort of could get away with stuff mm. and or it could be quite masked and then i also have a child with autism so i've i've been i sort of spend a lot of time around the sort of autism and that whole world and i felt i kind of knew that so i think when i was thinking of that unlikely friendship the friendship between the up and down of bipolar disorder and the sort of the the incredible, straight unvarying line. straight line of, of, you know, somebody with autism when they're really trying to keep out all of the up and down. <laughs> yeah. um, that seemed like a really irresistible clash. Brilliant. And if you could tell us about, so once you've got the script and, and everything's got the green light, just the, the period before, so your, kind of your rehearsal, and how, how did you kind of approach that, say, working with your actors and getting, those, getting them ready? I mean, one of the brilliant things that, in fairness, Kate, uh, uh, who produced the film, did was that she nagged the agents and and, you know, and the actors into giving us like several weeks of rehearsal. And that was kind of the making of the film, especially on a low budget film, because you are going to shoot so quickly when you hit the, hit the set. Mm-hmm. Everybody just totally needs to know who they are. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, that, and no, time for hanging around. no, so we 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 workshopped everything every scene we we rehearsed we brought the guys who were playing people with autism into an autism drama group and spent a lot of time they spent a lot of time embedded in the autism drama group and then in fact we used loads of the people from the autism drama group as extras in the scenes which are set in the in the unit that's in, in the autism residential unit in the film 
And then similarly uh, for Dermot's character, uh, Gabriel, uh, the drummer, um, we, you know, I introduced him to quite a few musician friends of mine who have had mental health kind of issues and who had been in that life and we went to St. Pat's. We did a lot of we did a lot of rehearsals, the rock and roll stuff in the music center because I wanted to bring the actors into a sort of a grungy place for. So we, you know, we. I felt that was kind of gold actually that time. Yeah, it made it more authentic. Obviously, I think it just meant that everybody knew there was no surprises really on set, you know. And the shooting itself went smooth enough. Right? I find I love shooting. Yeah. I think once you, if, if you, it's like once you're, like I find it really exciting. It's like being on stage though as well because even when things go wrong, yeah, you know a lot of time that's kind of great as well. It's often times when something you've to plan very carefully, but then when things go wrong, it's all it it often opens a kind of a sort of another weird door opens sometimes if you're awake. To it. I mean sometimes you have to just uh, be ready to adjust. So that's yeah. part of it. But the other thing is sometimes the thing goes wrong suggests a new thing to you that's really really interesting and I think I just think all of that stuff I mean that's really because I it's in some ways it's incredibly helpful being a kind of I mean as a director I'm technically quite inept in in a lot of ways in the sense I don't really I mean I kind of have a camera and I do I do think visually and I do think about shots like I think about the but you know in terms of like you know the shutter speed that I like and you know that stuff like I'll, I'll lean very heavily on you know the people around me but I think what's really good is it allows me to really um sort of declutter so I actually do think of what's going on with these are characters, and that's very. I think. So you concentrate on characters and yeah, and, and, and well, and, and just and you know, and what's 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 going on in the shot? You know, what's going on in the scene? What do we what do we feel about this? Or am I buying this? Am I am I enjoying this? Or is it is there something? Would it be weird if instead of him hitting her, uh, or she hit him, or he, you know, just being awake, being when you're because you, yeah, and I think that's it's kind of really obvious thing. But it's no, like all the technical stuff that you shouldn't be worrying about as a director. Yeah. I mean, except for it'll steal time. So yeah. sometimes people will tell you, you don't have much time left because this thing is broken. Yeah. But you should try to as little as possible. You should try to outsource everything like that so you can really create a little story bubble. Yeah. When you're there. And I think that's the biggest thing is to have you and the actors. But I mean, and also, sorry, you're. You know, everybody who makes the film is making the film. Yeah. So everybody's in the story yeah. bubble. But, you you know, you just, they've just got an arm of in, you know, like, yeah. Yeah. so you need their arm. Like, you don't, all the other bits of them which are dealing with, you yeah. know, the sandwiches and the, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, the, the light bulbs bra breaking. You, you don't have to know about that bit. Yeah. You, but, you know, it's sunset. So can you give me a little, you know, help me here. Yeah. But you, so I think that's the thing is to have, have your story bubble. Yeah. So, yeah, very much get a great team together. Trust them and let them do their job. Yeah, and enjoy. You know, there's it's it's energy. There's a. I mean, sometimes some some things get very te technical, and you have to be more cerebral about have we got this. But I mean, <clears throat> for, there was only two days where I looked at rushes myself, partially because I knew there was no time to go back, and it was just two stunts we did where I just wanted to make sure we pulled it off. Yeah. So, but generally, you know, if I feel, if you know, I I. I I call it quite quickly, actually. If I think we're, if I think it's good, I'd, I'd sooner, I'd sooner keep the intensity up, you know, and keep everybody in. Yeah, keep moving and, and yeah. build on that. Yeah. In yeah. terms of the jump, so you've had a lot of very successful shorts, and then ads obviously are, are short. The jump in time, so your, the amount of time you, you're shooting, so keeping your energy up, and then the kind of marathon that is post production. How, how did you kind of manage yeah. that? Well, uh, to take it in reverse order, I mean, I'm very used to spending a lot of time in post-production. Okay. I mean, on Tom Crean, who did that Guinness ad, I probably spent six weeks in in, a, in an edit suite in London. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I like including like several days with the people doing the artificial snow. Like there's okay. people in Soho, their only job is... They're called snow business. I think there's two of them, actually. <laughs> there's there's, there's, there's no business like snow yeah, business. Yeah, and, and like, you know, so... So I have spent a lot of time in those things. And there's a funny thing as well where, I mean, 
post production is kind of it's much more yogic or philosophical. Like you have to sort of go away and yeah. let things happen, and then come back and you try stuff out a lot. And it's quite um discursive, sort of philosophical, sort of feminine. Sh- how do we feel about this kind of space as opposed to? So I I've generally. I'm very used to that. And even it's like making records. I mean, being in studios is very like that. You know, there's real parallels between rock and roll and film for me, like incredibly, incredible amounts of things. There's a duality. Yeah, I've kind of become very used to it. And there's also, it also has those two things where there's also a sort of a, okay, you're on, which is like you're shooting or you're on stage. And that that sort of adrenaline-y thing. I think for me, the hardest bit, to be honest, is the waiting to get, to do it yeah. I found I found that took every time I rewrote a draft I found that mm. achingly hard and I, you have to do it thinking this is the definitive one and then you present it and then they say you have made such great progress <laughs> this is so brilliant I love what you've done here look and you're just waiting for the butt yeah. you know and so and I'm but you know I have to admit that it's it's a much better film for you know a lot of the rewriting was also to do with practical stuff as well but um, I think the biggest jump from short stuff to to longer stuff is um, it is in the writing. It's in, you know, as opposed to in the directing, because in a funny kind of a way, if you felt it on the page, if you can get used to the beats of a feature on the page, by the time you get to shoot it, you, you know, shooting, you're always you can only ever look six feet ahead of yourself shooting yeah you know you're thinking okay we've got to get this thing and this thing and this thing yeah did we get this thing do we get this thing yeah there's a bit of you know there is an arc with the actor a bit and the actors have to do you know they have to do work and you you know you have that but i kind of find once you've if you've done it on the page and that's really i found that with the sweating around the track yeah of of getting a feature script sort of singing and where you are carried through when you read it once you've done that and you can and you feel that you have done that I think the, sh- the shooting of it is not hard yeah the cheapest your, the cheapest time is your own yep yeah no there's no there's, there's I mean it's yeah, <laughs> though it is expensive. <laughs> it's it's yeah. expensive on but, you but, uh, but yeah no no of course of things, course yeah. no no of course but it's the but it makes you know it makes sense. I do. I think, and I mean, I'm I'm writing a feature at the moment. I just I've been, you know, I'm, I'm writing rewriting a new draft for another project, and I've just got notes, and I've gone working through the notes, and there's some of the notes I don't agree with, and some of the notes I do agree with, but I'm not sure how to to fix them, and then <laughs> and then some of them, but I, and I sort of, but I you know, went around for a run today, and. There was one little chunk of stuff. I suddenly had a kind of a good idea about how to fix that. So yeah. we'll start with that. Yeah, you know, and it's it's but it's um, I mean, writing is hell, you know. But like it's I've done it all my life, so I kind of I'm used to that hell. It's like it's a, it's a nice dry heat. That's what I, said, <laughs> I said right. <laughs> Can I ask you just to, just one or two things just to finish up? Sure. Um, just about rejection, especially for young filmmakers who might be listening. Oh, I'm glad you're going to ask me about how this. How do you deal with being turfed out? Okay, I think it's really important that you understand that for, so two things are really important to understand first of all the best thing that you will ever do you won't know it when you're doing it <laughs> the trick is quality quantity not quality the trick is to do a load of stuff with really good heart as best you can and somewhere in there will be the best thing you ever do okay you don't know if you're doing it right you won't be able to tell because actually it's not your brain giving stuff to other people's brains. It's your guts giving stuff to other people's guts. And oftentimes your brain doesn't realize what your guts wants to say. Or like I've so often as a songwriter had the experience of people coming up to saying, yeah, that song, that's about, that's about X, isn't it? I'd say, no, no, no. And then you're thinking, no, do you know what it is about X actually? And X sometimes is like a really embarrassing thing, which to be honest, you wouldn't have set out to write a song about. But I think what happens is you speak in a language that you don't understand, that the instinctive choices that you're drawn to make when you're writing. Yeah. 
So you find your way into an emotional truth. I guess. You're. I think that you. Well, you can't help it. I think that, that if you if you if you're doing things that are really alive for you, they're different to you as well. They have a life outside you. And like humans, they're di- you know they're mysterious to you sometimes. <laughs> so I, so that sounds like a really pretentious thing to say, but I no, believe it. No, no, but no. the thing that's really helpful then is then what you've just got to do is is accept that of every fifty things you try, two will work if you're lucky, and usually the two you least expect. And that that might not be the same as the two best things you do or whatever, but. So I really think it's it's like a Buddhist thing is that you've got to every time you go into something, don't sweat it. You know, there's no point. Like you've just got to go in with good heart, and then see what happens. Mm. And you know, if you can do that, and not get discouraged or not get distracted, you'll get, you know, you'll get to do the good thing, just because you've gone, you've just done so many things. <laughs> and I just think that that's. And, you know, and obviously if a door opens, I mean, run as fast as you can through that door. Well, you know, when it does open, I mean, don't hang about. <laughs> but I think I think that the rejection, I mean, I think rock and roll, you get a lot of rejection. I had a lot of rejection when I was a child, actually. I was like I was a very unpopular child, so I was very used to being rejected, I think. Then I went into rock and roll, which is like almost kind of comical levels of rejection <laughs> at all times. <laughs> yeah. And then I went into advertising, and, you know, I wrote five scripts for Guinness which got made which is like but I wrote over 300 scripts which got rejected to get those five made now I just know for a fact that most other copywriters in who in Dublin didn't write 300 scripts so they didn't get 25 ads for Guinness I think that's the, I honestly think it's not like I think I'm smarter than all those other people no. I just think that I just kept throwing throwing scripts at them and then and it's usually the weird thing like all your best ones got shot down it was like a weird little drummer boy kind of made it to the enemy trenches, you know. It's like weird. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, I just think that, you know, I just think I'd have, I've had so much rejection in my life that I just, when I go into film, I, you know, I don't like it. I love, I love affirmation. <laughs> I love it. I crave, I'm addicted to it. Yeah. But I, I, I know that it's not my, it's not going to be like that mostly. That's great. I think that's a really nice place to leave it. Thanks so much for coming in. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks a million.